welcome everybody to the Community Design Thinking Workshop for 50 plus people. Can you go ahead and push to the next slide, Michael? Yeah. We're going to do some intros and then review a recent project that we did um, where we demonstrate the skills to share and then we'll jump right into the interactive portion with a hands-on practice session in Miro which will produce a map of where y'all are from, and then dot voting on what part of the presentation you want to know more about, and we'll dive deeper into what people voted on in the Q&A until time is up. I'm Bonnie Wolf. I'm the Executive Director of Hack for LA. We are the Los Angeles chapter of Code for America. Hack for LA has about 400 active weekly members in our Slack community, and we run about 20 plus projects at any given time with both government, nonprofit, and community stakeholders and partners. The project we're talking about today is our consult, uh, our, consult, our consultation on the Los Angeles Department of Neighborhood Empowerment's website redesign. The Los Angeles Na Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, also known as DUNN, supports the largest neighborhood council system in the country. Each of the neighborhood councils has a publicly elected board made up of volunteers for a total of 1,800 volunteer board members with about 40,000 members in each neighborhood council. The department under Raquel, the general manager, and Julianne, the director of innovation, is one of the most innovative departments in the city, on the forefront of community engagement. We are fortunate to have them as our partner as we seek to increase engagement between government and the people it serves. We are also lucky to have rising public servant Grace Kim on the project, who is invaluable in managing all the coordination details, media responsibilities, and generally keeping everyone on track. Hacker LA has been relationship building with various government partners over the past year and a half. Two of the projects we have worked on have been with Dunn. In the interest of time, I won't go into details now, but if you want to know more, you'll be able to read the notes uh, about these projects in the slide deck. I mention this history because what, what we were about to ask the city to do required a lot of trust. I don't think that they would have agreed to spend so much staff time on this process or trusted volunteers to do it had we not had the history of delivering projects that directly improved or identified areas for improvement in community engagement. The challenges, budget shortfalls, no in-person meetings, and trying to solicit the perspectives and priorities of 4 million people. Easy, right? Enter the social good consultants. Michael and Rachel have been helping Hack for LA by donating their services on worthy in-person in projects and now completely online ones. They are LA's best human-centered design firm and focus on using design thinking for civic and social change. Hands down, this project would not have been possible without their expertise, patience, and delivery. Thank you for that, Bonnie, and that introduction. And so first, I'm going to start off by talking about our design thinking approach. So our approach to design thinking is based on the belief that the most effective solutions to challenging problems come directly from the communities and individuals experiencing them. In this case, we wanted to hear directly from the individuals and communities who use the Empower LA website and therefore most impacted by the site's current challenges and potential improvements. So our design thinking approach really kind of hits on a few areas and you know, for this workshop, it was the ideal solution. And it allows us to engage multiple community members and stakeholders by using tools like a digital whiteboarding, which you kind of can see here, and you'll learn more as we go uh, on through this presentation. Uh, we also want to ensure that we are able to reduce bias and promote equitable decision-making. So you can see kind of here some anonymous dot voting. And you know, using our approach, we also increase efficiency, removing the unnecessary conversations that typically happen when we work together. and, and you know, allowing everyone to rapidly ideate on solutions. Um, and this allows us to gather insights directly from the users and understand their needs, align the participants of the prioritization of those needs to help them make better informed decisions as they develop their new website. Bonnie. Oh, sorry. Um, an important part of scoping of the work was making sure that our partners had the time and the authority for the project and that we could meet their expectations and that we have regular communication time set up. I won't read all the details on this slide, but I can say both parties brought many resources to the table to make sure that the program we produced was both socially and legally inclusive. And that included being willing to pick up the phone and call people we wanted to include, but who had not responded and recruiting extra facilitators to ensure that we could accommodate more people than we planned for. 
And so where did we start with all with this project? We started by uh, trying to include as many perspectives as possible. And we started with a survey that really had two major goals. One, the survey was to help us understand the user pain points and areas for improvement on the Empower LA website. And this information also acted as a foundation that helped that informed us in the creation of the workshop itself. And the second thing was to help us ensure that we're offering a truly inclusive and accessible opportunity. And so for that, we included options questions around diversity because we want representation from all over LA with different backgrounds, ages, ethnicities, gender, etc. Language because we have translation was an available thing that we had for this workshop. Uh, technical, we you know gave people the option to join from their smartphone or tablet, not just their computer. And of course ability, we wanted to um, you know have accessibility options available such as closed captioning and audio translation. And so now, as we you know, go into actually designing the workshop, um, we focused on two areas of concern. We took the information from the, um, from the survey, or actually, sorry, let me take a step back. So after analyzing the, the survey results, we saw two top trends, the navigation of the homepage and the neighborhood council pages, which were the immediate concerns that people had. And in order to help us unpack these two areas, it was important to use the data we initially gathered from the survey to inform how we would design the workshop. And so we created a series of exercises that included simple methods like working together alone. And you can see here, there's like individual workspaces around this major board, you know, to be able to create rapid ideation you know, grouping trends and dot voting, like I mentioned earlier, you know, which allows us to include all the voices in the room and to create alignment and consensus on the top needs within these two areas. And an important component to helping us achieve this was splitting this large group, right? This is, I think, only one page of everyone who attended into smaller groups of five to eight. And this is key for our success uh, when you're doing the design thinking workshop with over 10 people, and especially if you're talking about 50 or more participants. And so we broke them up into smaller groups to improve efficiency, help elicit better conversation, and it also helps ensure that everyone has a chance to be heard. And you know, our goal uh, is to also align the entire group, not just the individual uh, groups that, that broke out. And so we included moments where all individual groups could come together and share out their individual findings and present their top trends. So that it kind of builds a shared understanding of what we're doing and what is being discussed. And while breaking up such a large group is great, it also presents a challenge of needing multiple facilitators. And thankfully we had Bonnie and the amazing Hack for LA volunteers, which Bonnie's gonna go and expand more about recruitment and how we got all those people. UX professionals are looking for volunteer opportunities to participate in well-run projects. Many of them have graduated from UX educa educational programs and have not gotten any work experience outside of school. Some of them are working but are looking for opportunities to expand their skill sets. Some are just looking to give back. We offer training and an opportunity to do work with real users and reputable partners. So how do you find the people that you need? Um, the steps are easy when you know how. So find people who are already interested in UX. There are groups on Facebook, Reddit, Slack, Discord, pretty much everywhere. Make a form asking for the minimum information you need. You can always ask for more information later once they express interest. Um, that's an example of Hackville's interest form, and I'll provide a link to the form um, in the slides. Um, and then post the form to those groups that you found. Set up Zoom registration invites and email to the interest list with your training dates and some compelling text. Don't be afraid to use emojis to stand out from every other email that your potential volunteers who've already expressed interest are gonna get. Um, and then maintain your, pi your pipeline. No training program is going to be perfect. The people you train will help you make it better if you make space and encourage it. Some people learn at different paces or don't have access to expensive educational programs. Offering more than one training allows for people to catch up and creates more inclusivity and reduces the chances that you won't have enough people when the event comes. Obviously, the sending thank yous matters. And lastly, helping people to further their careers through your project is a great way to encourage repeat volunteering, and it's just the right thing to do. 
All right, so now we have this, this amazing group of volunteers and in order to leverage this amazing community, it requires us, like Bonnie mentioned, to train these volunteers and help them become design thinkers like ourselves. And so our goal for the, uh, to train the facilitations is, uh, is to level up the volunteers coming to us from hack for la and prepare them to be able to facilitate the workshop, to test run some of our workshop design and test out logistics because we always want to, you know, give ourselves the opportunity to be able to iterate and to ensure that we're aligned Aligned finally uh, on the workshop goals. Whoop, I lost my place. <laughs> and we did this by holding uh, several uh, training sessions. And in these training sessions, we introduced people to the goal of the project, our approach to solving this specific challenge, and tools like Miro. And together, we walked through the high level parts of the workshop, experimented a little, and answered any questions people may have about facilitation to prepare them for the big day. So, a major component for a successful workshop with so many facilitators, especially those who have never facilitated before, is to have a facilitation guide. And this facilitation guide ensures that everyone's on the same page. And this guide acted as a script for each volunteer to work off of and to ensure we're keeping pace across multiple groups. And we built it in Google Docs so facilitators could easily make a copy, modify it to their needs, highlight their roles or anything that might be helpful to them as they uh, facilitate on that day. And then, of course, remote tools. You know, it's a, it's a big part of this. And when choosing uh, digital tools, we're always looking for the ones people are familiar with, such as Zoom, like we're in today. Um, that, and, but we're also looking for tools that help us accomplish um, the goals that we're, we're, set, we're setting out to do, such as Miro, which is, a, again, a collaborative digital whiteboarding uh, tool. And the biggest challenge when introducing new tools, such as Miro, is getting all participants ramped up and comfortable using the tool with minimal friction while in the workshop. And you'll actually get to experience this in quite in a, in a little bit and as part of the workshop design we also include exercises that would ease people into the experience before getting deep into discussion to ensure proper uh, participation so now it's time for the workshop and you know to execute a size of this project, we need a very strong support team, which included several roles. Of course, you have uh, Rachel uh, and myself who lead the whole process and the major group sections of the workshop. Each team will have a lead facilitator, which will lead the individual group exercises. There's also a co-facilitator for each group to ensure things are running smoothly for the facilitator and the participants. We also included a tech support and tr transcriber for each group, and their roles was pretty much to transcribe information from uh, into Miro for those who were attending from their smartphones and to help with any technical issues. And let's not forget, we also had some done staff in each group so that they were able to uh, take some time to actually listen to what people are saying and also add any additional context necessary for the participants. And of course, we had Bonnie, who was our Zoom host and held it all together. Oh, but let's not forget that some people also required a translator and a closed captioner. So those people also uh, had the opportunity to join the group. And so this was our support uh, group for each individual group. And, you know, this helped us to ensure that things went smoothly. And of course, when you do all of these things that we've mentioned, everything's just going to work out perfectly, right? No one ever said that. No one. <laughs> And it's important to be flexible and adaptable. We had some tech issues that caused us to get behind, which meant we needed to cut out some things to catch up and stay on time. We posted in our Slack to ensure that we were communicating across all the different groups and our facilitators were on, bo on board or um, aligned on what was happening. But flexibility is vital. And having an inclusive workshop also means you have participants operating with different social norms than you would be working with the team. And so having a few people to even jump in into side conversations when something was, for instance, someone was spamming a chat, was crucial to helping keep everyone on task and not drag the energy down. So we did all of this, what are the outcomes? For now, um, we're gonna, we'll be taking the information gathered in this, uh, in this first workshop into an a alignment workshop with the Dunn leadership and some website development team, or some of the people from the website development team. Um, and here we'll be able to align on which of the solutions decided upon during this first workshop are actually um, feasible and viable for both uh, Dunn and also the people 
that will be executing the, the work. Um, they'll also receive a summary report at the end of all of this um, with recommendations on what to include on the current website redesign and, the, and based on the data that we gathered and also an, an analysis of the learnings from each workshop to help inform future decisions when updating the site. So, like I mentioned, you're gonna get a chance to mess around in Miro. And also it's gonna be interesting to uh, see how everyone does. First, I'm gonna give everyone a quick tour of, of Miro, just two minutes. But for the most part, I'm just gonna throw you all in there and you're gonna get a chance to play. So really quickly, let me just, for those of you who have not used Miro, um, for the most part, we're just going to be using these stickies that are around here. Um, you're going to double click in them and you're going to write your, your name and then place them on the map, right? My name is Michael Parker Chavez and I'm in California down here by Los Angeles. Um, plus and minus buttons on your keyboard are going to be your best friends. Uh, they're going to allow you to zoom in and out uh, of place. And if you don't want to use your keyboard on the bottom right, there's also plus and minus buttons that you can use to zoom in and out with a little map. Um, and on the left hand side, you have a toolbar that you want to that you can use uh, to ensure that you have this selection tool, you should have this little blue arrow, um, which will ensure that when you double click on a post that you're actually able to write in it and you're not creating anything new. But I'm going to place this link in the chat. And we're going to get everyone in there. Oh, how did I get to the chat from here? Chat. Where'd it go? Chat. All right. So you don't need to create an account. It's going to ask you to create an account if you want to. But you can just click on the link. All of you are going to start popping in. Awesome. I'm seeing a lot of little arrows flying around. I love it. So while everyone's coming in, I'm gonna set a timer, which is also a very important piece to all of this, for five minutes, no more. Um, and, you know, like I said, just grab a post-it from anywhere around the map and write your name on it and then place it on the map. Does anyone have any questions? Or is everyone pretty good? I see everything's looking pretty good. Um, while you all are doing that, I will say that we had quite a few people who were dialing into our Zoom facilitation that were on uh, phones um, or otherwise couldn't figure out how to use the tool, but that was what the transcriber was for. So anybody who expressed that they had trouble getting, you know, putting post-its on there for whatever reason, they were able to write something directly in the chat and we would post it for them. And we basically made those pairings um, very quickly on in the process. So they had somebody they could reach out to privately. Um, so they weren't othered in the session. That was that big support group that I mentioned. I see some people making their post-it bigger. Um, usually what ends up happening is you can just hit the plus or minus button to zoom in and out. You don't have to make your post-it bigger. I'll also be here to help you out. You can just write what you need to write down. Awesome. I'm seeing some people from Tennessee, North Carolina, Colorado, some people from up north in California, some people in Minnesota. Michael, is there a fan on in your room? There is. There's the AC. Is it pretty loud? You can just kind of hear it. It's creating some noise on the line. Okay. Mute myself for a second, it should stop. Can you try to delete that big post it? They're still writing in it, so I have to wait until they click off of it and just I can resize it. It does not matter what color post it you use, just use anyone you like. You have two minutes left. Someone drew a nice line to their post-it. 
they want to be very specific of where they're at. <laughs> And then I would ask that when you're done with your um, with placing your post-it, if you could kind of move your mouse off of the map, and then once the map is quiet, we'll know everybody's done. All right, just a minute left. We're going to keep the interactions going once we finish with this. We want to give you some control over the, the rest of the conversation. All right, I think it looks like everyone is done. Awesome. I see one still there. Is there anybody good? Who, All right. who is unable to do it and would like me to post your name someplace, then feel free to message me privately. All right, I'm going to bring everyone over a little bit to the right. And so now we're going to move on to our next exercise, which what we're going to do here is we wanted to give you all the control to align on what is what should our discussion be. We want to be able to unpack one of these areas, you know, through our presentation. We went through everything really quickly, um, but we want to be able to answer, you know, more of your questions in any one topic. So those little red dots that you see all over, what I want everyone to do is to take one dot, actually, no, two dots, because everyone seems to be pretty good at this. You're going to get two dots and you just place it inside of the rectangle, the white rectangle with the, um, with the label on it. I'm gonna give you all two minutes because you all seem to be pros at this to be able to vote. And then we're gonna use that to start our discussion and uh, kick off Q&A. I love seeing all the little cursors moving everywhere. Okay, we have all designers in the room because everybody wants to make a straight line with their little po with their little circles. <laughs> It's actually something I was trying out. I wasn't sure how to be able to let a bunch of people vote all together. And so um, I actually use like a grid option for each frame. So it just snaps the, the circles in place, the votes. Remind me how many dots you want us each to use? Two, two voting dots. OK. Michael, could you can you delete the drawing or move it out of the space? And there's a video, somebody's posted a video thing. You have 20 seconds left to cast your last vote, make some doodles. I see people are having fun. <laughs> All right. So time is up. And it looks like the first thing we want to discuss is scoping the work. So that will be the, the first one. Um, so like Bonnie mentioned, we'll use the remainder of the time to do a Q&A. Um, and so you can use the, the chat. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, but you can use the chat to, to put your questions in. But we want to specifically focus on scoping the work. What questions do you have around scoping, scoping the work? And then after a little bit, maybe we'll switch to the second highest um, voted topic, and then we can answer some more questions in that. So who has the first question? Who, whoever voted on scoping the work, what's a question that you had? What is the project? Ask one in the first chat. One. I'm going to take that one first. Um, so what is the project? So the project basically was 
for Hack for Lay to consult on how could the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment make their website redesign process more inclusive of the community. Um, the way the Neighborhood Empowerment um, Organization runs is there's neighborhood uh, advocates. And there is about, I think, seven advocates for all 99 neighborhood councils. So they, they thought they had a pretty good sense of what neighborhood council board members are frustrated with. Um, but it didn't seem like once they kind of got all those notes together for us, that that was sufficient to help them launch an entire redesign. So originally when we talked to them, most of their design was based on what they thought that people wanted. And we offered the opportunity to, um, to actually find out what people wanted from them directly in a focused way. Because they had had public meetings before about other large topics like this, and the, and the results hadn't been all of that, all that useful. Um, at, Jess asked, as a community voice is surfaced through this process, how do you manage if and when the need desires fundamentally at odds or challenging to the stakeholders initial framing intent and goals? And Michael, I think you can answer that. Yeah, I mean, I think for this, um, you know, the, a big challenge in any organization is kind of this idea of like, well, we know what people want, you know, we, we've, we've been hearing people and, you know, we, we have an idea of what people need. And then a lot of people just move forward with a solution that they think is going to solve that. But in this specific case, you know, uh, with Bonnie's help and hack for lay, we were able to make the case of, you know, we have a way of being able to gather this information from people in a focused manner in an efficient and effective way so that it can give us that data that helps, you know, done in this specific case, make these better informed decisions of what they should include or what they should focus, right? No project has unlimited budget and time. And so how do we prioritize the things that are going to be the most important for the, for the people who are going to be impacted by this, these changes that are going to be coming to the site? Um, let me see. Does that answer? Well, I want to do a follow up on that. One of the things that came out of this, one of the things that people were um, most concerned about was something that neighbor empowerment thinks they already do well. Um, you know, that the website already addresses this issue. So how is it that this is the top issue? Well, it's not, it's not done well. Um, you know, it's not effective. So hearing that from people directly is really key. And, and that will reprioritize how much time they spend on that, um, making that work more effectively. Yeah, and actually, I have one last thing to add to that as well. As an example, um, one of the one of the things that also you know through this process is we're not just identifying things that are going to be directly on the website. Sometimes some of the changes are operational. So one of the things that came out of it, I think uh, there was something that got prioritized pretty high up with some type of chat feature. Yes, there are many options, you know, off the shelf chat features that you can include on your website. But really, you know, through this alignment workshop, we can have that discussion of like, is there even capacity at done that can even be oversee this chat feature, right? And so then it becomes this balance of like, yes, it's very feasible from a technical standpoint. But is, you know, from an operational standpoint, is it actually something that that is is viable? And so having those conversations really helps to make sure that, you know, we are part prioritizing the things that are going to be the most valuable and are actually, you know, for both sides, the users and done themselves. Do we have any more uh, questions in the scoping the work area? No. Okay. I think we can okay. move on to yeah. the approach. Yeah. So our design thinking approach, what questions do you all have about that? Somebody can go ahead and unmute and ask the first question while other people are typing. Yeah. What's the next step? Uh, so the next step from the, the first half of what we discussed is an alignment workshop. Uh, what are they going to build? So that's what the alignment workshop is actually going to cover. So now we're going to take, you know, a lot, all the information and the learnings from the survey, which was a, a broad way to gather some insights because we also asked very specific questions around what are users challenges. Um, Cause not everybody that filled out the survey made their way into the workshop. Um, and then we also are taking the information from the workshop and bringing that all to done um, with, with their leadership and some people from the actual development uh, or the, 
the company that's going to develop the website to, again, ensure that there's alignment on uh, viability and feasibility of the solutions that you know, we're able to implement within their time, within their budget, and with, of course, most importantly, their users' needs. Um, uh, Roshan asked a question about platform and language, but I don't know if he's referring to like what kind of technical platform, and that was outside of the scope of this. The, the people we were asking for their opinions were not asking the community what, uh, what platform should be used. Um, uh, regarding the, um, was it hard to keep so many people focused on the design thinking approach and not go off on tangents all the time? Um, we had one particular, um, and this is being recorded, um, so we had one particular um, person who really needed to get their opinion heard a lot, like constantly in the chat and in the room itself, um, uh, knocking things off track. Um, and they were questioning the legitimacy of the process. Um, uh, whether or not it was even effective, and um, and anybody who's worked in any public setting with um, with you know long-standing kind of uh, volunteer groups for the community knows you know this particular type of uh, archetype, um, and we just really respected the questions. I think we could have done a better job of setting norms um, in the beginning. We did set them, but um, I think if we had pasted them into the chat. And then we could have reminded everybody just at regular intervals as a matter of course that, hey, here are our norms. Um, just reminding everybody before we go to the next session, that kind of thing. Um, but we just, you know, kept responding respectfully. Me and other people communicated them with them directly. Um, um, and in my case, I gave uh, him an example of I built a half a billion dollars with the software. And when somebody first told me about design thinking workshop, I'm like, that's a terrible way to do requirements gathering, seriously, people. And I'm, I was wrong. And <laughs> now I'm a true believer um, because I've seen how effective it can be at getting so many divergent uh, opinions, perspectives um, all together in one place so quickly. Um, so I would told him that, I told the person that via the, um, via the private message, and that seemed to slow, slow their role, so to speak. But it continued to be an issue till the end. And then when we got to the very end of the workshop and they saw, the, they saw all the post-its from all the different groups and how they aligned together, they also became a true believer. So it was worth the extra trouble. And this is, that workshop was recorded. Um, and all the breakout rooms were recorded. So that is part of the public record and will be available on their, um, on the city's website. Yeah. And that, that story that Bonnie shared is not, it's, it, this happens almost every time we do any type of large gatherings because this approach, right, um, is, can be uncomfortable for certain people, people that have, you know, for much of their career dominated conversations or are good at selling their ideas, right? They're, they typically kind of play, uh, play a very key role in whatever is happening in their organization. And so now kind of removing, you know, their ability to just talk out loud um, can be comfortable. And that's also something that when designing the workshop is really important is how do we balance that um, removing of conversations to make sure everyone's heard, but then also make space, especially for the people who have lived experiences um, to be able to speak um, and to be able to share because it's really important to be able to build that shared foundational understanding regardless of the, the problem you're trying to solve. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, it takes a critic to convert a critic. <laughs> Thanks, Timothy. Um, Rashan, you, you asked, uh, you use Miro to reduce the doubters. Um, I think it's just seeing the, the end result. I think with the story that Bonnie shared and what I was saying we've seen in other workshops we've done, I think people in the moment feel uncomfortable because they're, they kind of have blinders and are just experiencing what's happening to them in that moment. But at the end, you know, um, or actually, let me take a step back. I think what's always important is that people that participate in these workshops are passionate about the problem or are passionate that something is getting done. And so at the end, when they're able to actually see everything come together and that there are valuable outcomes, you know, that, that came out of this experience, that's when I think, you know, their mind changes and they say, oh, this was actually really worth it. And so, you know, Miro, I think just helps to, to show, you know, how we can do this remotely in a world where we're not able to, to meet in person, which, you know, changes the dynamics, but still allowed us to, I think, you know, convert the, the people who are doubters. 
Any uh, last questions in the design thing approach before we move to answering questions about the inclusive survey? Okay, let's do Thank it. Thank you, Rashawn. All right, so inclusive survey. What questions do you all have about that? Do you mind if I speak my question? Go ahead. No problem. <laughs> in the previous session, I was just in on criminal reform, criminal justice, um, data policing. Sorry. Um, uh, one of the sort of side comments uh, that surfaced was this idea that um, often, um, particularly communities of color, um, may not utilize a lot of the conventional channels for feedback and input um, that cities or uh, stakeholders or whatnot often use. So like surveys was one of the specific examples. Um, and so, and then sort of on the, on, alongside that, this idea of like digital access and, and um, just people not even being online. My question is, how do you ensure you're getting an actual representative cross-section of the population? Yeah, we originally um, were planning on, we didn't know how many people would respond, given that the, the, the invitation went out to 25,000 people. Um, so we didn't know what the response level would be. Um, they have a pretty decent open rate. It got mentioned in all of the newsletters, social media, all through the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Um, and we still didn't get as many applicants as we wanted because the application was quite extensive trying to be inclusive. Um, and so we ended up taking everybody that we got. Um, so everybody that, that, that applied got a spot in the workshop. Um, but we had uh, saved 100 spots. Um, with the idea of having at least one representative from every neighborhood council. Um, uh, did that, so did what that about other, did, But what about making sure that that hundred, I mean, aside from geographic location, that hundred people was, how would, were you able to measure whether that was actually a representative sample of the population as a whole, like either demographically, racially, socioeconomically? Yeah, the city has pretty extensive tools uh, built into their survey process because they use it quite a lot. Um, and it actually returned uh, information about what neighborhood council they were from, what, their, what they answered to the, um, to the racial questions, what they answered to the um, um, uh, sexual orientation uh, questions. Um, so we had, we had a pretty good sample. We were prepared to, be, to select some people and not others by looking at the data that the city could provide. It ended up that we were able to take everyone and we did actually end up getting quite a good healthy cross section, people from, um, people from different parts of the city, people for, with different lived experiences, people with different technical backgrounds. I mean, we had some people that basically, the smartphone is all they had, they didn't have anything else. Um, so that's how they'd be accessing the city website to people who are accessing it on multiple devices, to people who need a translation, to people who are using assistive uh, um, uh, devices uh, like uh, TTY terminals. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and I think the other thing that I would like to add there too is that Dunn themselves, you know, we had these weekly meetings to kind of even look at what are the the surveys that are the answers that are coming in, the respondents, and you know, when we saw certain regions that were not participating, you know, they went out and reached out to those communities specifically. So it's really about being as intentional as possible. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that it's like, oh, everyone's going to get a chance. There is going to always be those challenges of people who may not have access to the, the right technology, you know, who may not be able to, to uh, participate. And I think that's going to be an ongoing challenge. And, and you know, Zoom or using digital tools or doing things remotely in some ways, you know, opens up the, the opportunities, but in other ways it also limits. And so it's not something that is quite solved yet. And we're always constantly thinking about it. How do we, you know, include these people like, uh, you know, that may not have the technology necessary to even participate. And so we're working on that, you know, it, it's an ongoing process. Yeah, and so Noel asked our neighborhood council's representative of the um, neighborhoods they represent. Um, the system overall is like most institutional systems, <laughs> primarily dominated by cisgender white males. Um, there are some neighborhood councils that are extremely representative of their communities, um, and the and, and the numbers are changing. Um, 
uh, some of the people who were sent to represent from their neighborhood councils were did not look like the makeup of the board and instead looked more like the community. Um, and that was an intentional choice on the on the neighborhood council side. Um, and then uh, there was a question about on the gender question, if if so, how many um, choices were there? Um, do you, Michael, do you know what that was? I don't remember exactly. It was a, a list that the city of LA uses for all their surveys. So it was a, a decent, like a pretty extensive list. And they're always, they even, you know, mentioned to us, like, we're always learning and adapting that list. It's not something that, hey, we have this one list and we're going to use for everything. They're, you know, things are changing as people learn it. And, you know, as these communities are, uh, you know, it's important to represent them. That list is continually uh, changing. And then the outreach that was done, it really was primarily through, um, through the uh, neighborhood advocates, but even Julian, the director of innovation, sent out direct emails to specific neighborhood councils because he had been an advocate before um, becoming the director of innovation, innovation. And he used to work for the mayor of Paris. Um, so he's got some experience bringing people to the table. And he just reached out and said, your voice will be on mute if you don't, if you don't send someone to tell us what you want the website to be about. He was very, very aggressive in a positive way uh, about making sure that we had the kind of inclusivity we were looking for. Timothy asked, um, any stats on represent, uh, representativeness, like higher or lower representation than in the population? I don't think we really looked at that, did we, Bonnie? Or I mean... No, the people who applied and the people who showed up registered and then the people who showed up, the numbers, the numbers will keep dropping uh, of that. And we haven't done an after the fact um, analysis. And actually, thank you for asking the question because I think it's worth doing as part of our overall presentation uh, before the alignment workshop, because I think it's, imp I know it's important um, to have context for the data that we're providing. These are the opinions represented by these groups. Yeah, I also saw uh, Rashawn say almost everyone has a smartphone and then Heather said, uh, you know, keyword almost, not everybody does, which is, which is actually, you know, it's really interesting because even if you have a smartphone, you may not have a strong enough connection or not enough data, right, on your phone to be able to participate in something like this. And, you know, we had some participants using their phones, which that's where the, um, the support, the technical support transcriber people played a role in taking their information in, but we needed to have them in place because, you know, being on Miro and on Zoom at the same time on, the, on your phone is not really the best experience. And so we, you know, we try, we worked to kind of alleviate that pain as much as possible to be able to include those people. But again, even if you have a smartphone, even if you have the, the data or the internet speeds required to do that, it still can be challenging, you know, but we, we did our best to try to include those people. But, you know, it, it, there's still a technical gap of, you know, accessibility. So I think now we need to move to training the facilitators, which was the other thing that got a lot of votes. Yeah, what questions does anyone have around training the facilitators? You had dots, where are your questions? Oh, um, oh, okay, so Will said, even as organizers of this conference, we've run into challenges for speakers who live in rural areas where broadband just isn't available. Thank you for that, yeah. How do you get enough facilitators if you are in a smaller city or town that doesn't have as many people interested in tech in it? Well, thank you for asking. That's really a recruitment question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Um, basically, Hack for LA has volunteers from all over the world. So yes, ideally brigades are local, but that all kind of went out the window when things went online. So don't just use facilitators locally. Use facilitators, anybody who's interested. Um, you will, when you do your reach out on Facebook groups and, um, and, and uh, Reddit and uh, Slack channels and things like that that are interested in UX research, um, those people will be global in nature anyway, or at least United States based, and feel free to invite them to the opportunity. Um, I think it's key as part of that, though, that you treat the UX facilitation group with the same eye to inclusivity that you do um, with 
the people that you're trying to bring to the workshop because nothing could be worse for a community um, that is very diverse than having 10 white facilitators show up and tell you they're going to help you run your workshop. Um, so I think that, you know, keeping an eye on that and, um, and having people apply for the, for the opportunity um, and, and train for it, but then selecting your, the group that you're going to go forward with based on, on what the needs are. Yeah, and one last thing that I'll add to that as well is, you know, one of the things we shared with our facilitators during training is like, you don't, you don't need to be an expert in whatever it is that we're, we're trying to do. You're really there to facilitate the conversation and to unlock the information that exists in the room. And so that's kind of another thing to remove that barrier. It's like, you don't need to be a UX designer. You just, you know, have to, you know, feel comfortable talking in front of people and, you know, be uh, wanting to facilitate these important conversations that are happening in these types of projects. And so, empathy, empathy, empathy. Yep. <laughs> you have so much empathy with the people who are getting exposed to something brand new for the first time. And your job is to help them be okay with it so that they can get through it and get their voice heard. Um, so yeah. the next question is in training facilitators, facilitators, how did you know when you were done training them? How did you feel they were ready to go? You only had one shot at this, right? Uh, yes, but we did hold two trainings. So there was one person we definitely wanted to include because she was representative of underrepresented communities. Um, and um, she went through the second, the training the second time so that she would be ready. They self-assessed. Um, and then we had them, gave them different roles. So you could sign up for the main facilitator or you could sign up to be a, a co-facilitator, you know, the secondary, or you could sign up to be the transcriber. And based on the people's experience level and comfort running a room like that, they really signed up for the right spots. Yeah, exactly. It was important. I think, you know, having that large of a support group uh, also allowed us that flexibility, like Bonnie mentioned, to be, because we want to give everyone the experience, right? The, uh, this specific person she was talking about, it's like she's shifting careers, and this is a, a really valuable opportunity for her. And so we didn't want to take that away just because, you know, they're, they're, like maybe she wasn't 100% uh, like comfortable being a main facilitator, but we wanted to give her the opportunity to experience how it all went, it came together, you know, put her with a, a really strong facilitator so that she could learn from from them so that when an opportunity like this comes around again which hack for la is working on those opportunities she can now feel empowered and ready and confident that she can actually take more of a lead role in, a, in another project and if you want to know what it's like to be trained as a facilitator to do some ux work then i will be adding a link to the discord and I can add it to the chat here and you can sign up on our UX interest list and volunteer for our next opportunity, which is, which is coming up very soon. The 27th is our next training. And we'll be doing a lot of, uh, a lot of projects like this. It seems like there's, there's a huge amount of people that want to do UX work and are looking for volunteer opportunities. And there are all kinds of organizations um, in the nonprofit and civic tech space that are looking to really understand what people want. Um, so the idea of bringing these two groups together um, and having um, and having kind of a uh, an army of people we can call on at a moment's notice to say, hey, let's let's get this information together so we can all make better decisions and make government work better for the people seems to be like the perfect execution of Code for America's mission. Yeah. And in yeah. answer to the question about whether they didn't have a UX understanding, everybody knew something coming into it. How much they knew was dependent on what their schooling was. Yeah, and I think we start like, you know, luckily in, in LA, because we have such a large group, we started with the, the UX designers just because they're, they tend to have at least some understanding of design thinking, or they've been told at some point. So it's a lot easier to kind of get them up and going. Um, they understand the importance of it. But, you know, really it's not limited to only them. And I'm a strong believer that design should not be left to only the designers, which is why for me, it's important to teach these types of processes and these types of tools to anybody who, you know, plays, uh, you know, a leadership role in whether it's in a, you know, a Fortune 500 company down to a community leader, you know, teach them how to use these tools to engage, you know, the people that the, their communities or, or their employees or anything like that and be able to use these types of tools. Oops, we have five minutes left before the end of the hour, so it's a free-for-all now. Any questions that you want, throw them in the chat or yeah. unmute if you want to first person to ask a question.
Yeah, see, that's the power of design thinking. We organized everybody's thoughts and we were able to answer the questions in a really efficient <laughs> manner. So are the facilitators role like the PM? So Rashawn asks, so are the facilitator role like the PM? I'm assuming product, like project manager, um, right? Yeah, project manager or product okay. manager. Yeah, yeah, um, I mean, I think it does help if you have um, like an understanding of the topic. And so even through our, our training, we uh, gave them an opportunity. We said, you have 10 minutes to just visit the site poke around, look at a bunch of different things. And also um, for this specific project, we had a couple people from some staff from Dunn to also give that additional context, right? You don't want to come in completely, um, you know, not knowing anything about the project, but you don't need to be an expert. Um, but yeah, so similar like a, like a PM, you're really there to kind of just facilitate and bring out the best in people in order to accomplish uh, your goals. I think in a lot of ways, it's been like being a hack night host. Uh, if I could really quick pitch. Uh, so Will and I um, were able to collaborate with Miro and get a, an account ready, partially sponsored by Code for America, partly sponsored by Miro, um, that's available for use by brigades for their projects. And uh, there are a number of features you can only get by paying Miro. Um, and one of them is the feature that y'all use tonight. So uh, that opens up the link to people to edit regardless of if they have an account. Uh, so just hit me up on the Code for America Slack. Uh, my, my, uh, my name is Thad K. Um, and I will add you to the channel that has the bot in it that will give you boards. So uh, what you do is you just ask the bot to give you a board and you get a board by direct message. So that will be coming soon for the moment. It's just concierge, so I will do it for you. I will give you a board, but soon there will be a bot. That's awesome, Daz. Thank you for that. Yeah, I forgot about that feature is extremely valuable, especially if you're doing something where you just want to open it up to as many people as possible. Well, back to you. All right. This was really great. Thank you for thank you for sharing this. I um, it's it's always fun to have a little bit of hands on time. Um, so we will, uh, we will end this session here. We've got um, two minutes before our keynote starts. Um, I, I very much encourage all of you to go to our keynote. Um, it's gonna be a conversation between Mutali and Conde and Lauren Ellen McCann, um, both absolutely fascinating people and, and real luminaries in civic tech. Um, and it'll be hosted by our, our own M. Burnett, um, who is, has been the, the project lead or the, the planning lead for Brigade Congress. Um, and then after that, there is a happy hour um, that is not just a happy hour. It is your chance to um, hear about the unconference sessions that are being pitched. So um, very important that you attend that if you're, um, if you're interested in participating in the unconference stuff that starts tomorrow. Um, so you can find all of those links on Kiko Chat, and I hope to see every single one of you there. Thank you very much for everyone for your time. Have a great day. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks, folks.